Welcome back students. <clears throat> In this video segment we will cover section 6.6 .6, inverse trigonometric functions. Okay so let's um let's take a look back at um let's take a look back at taking the derivative of a simple function. What's the derivative with respect to x of sine of x? That one's an easy one for you. It is for all of us. This is the cosine function, cosine of x. So now I pose the question, what is the derivative with respect to x of the inverse sine of x? Well, it turns out that we can't use calc 1 to do this. In fact, <clears throat> it turns out that the derivative of the inverse sine function or any of the inverse trig functions don't turn out to be trig functions at all. It's, it's a very, very strange thing. So that's our that's our task for today. Our task for this video segment is to review the inverse trig functions purely from a, a trig point of view without calculus. And then um, let's get some calculus involved. Let's, let's uh, look at derivatives and integrals involving the inverse trig functions. <clears throat> so let's start with, let's start with the sine function, um, the inverse sine function. So we know that the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. Okay, so it's also true that the inverse sine of 1 half is pi over 6. No big surprise. We know that that um, functions and inverses undo one another. They cancel each other out. So if the sine function turns pi over 6 into 1 half, then the inverse sine function turns 1 half back into pi over 6. So here's, a, here's another one for you. So we also know <clears throat> that the sine of 5 pi over 6 is 1 half. You think, think about it for a, little, for a second or two. 5 pi over 6, if you were to graph it in standard position, lies in quadrant 2. And in quadrant 2, the trig function's sine and some others, <laughs> cosecant, <laughs> are positive. Uh, in particular, the sine of pi, 5 pi over 6, then, is the same as the sine of 1 pi over 6 and 1 half. But the inverse sine of one half is still pi over six. It's not five pi over six. So it seems to to be that we it seems to, that we have a little bit of a problem. The um, the the problem is that the, that the the sine function is not one to one. So unless we do something with the domain of the sine function, it's not going to have an inverse. <clears throat> now remember, all of the trig functions, rather none of the trig functions, are one to one. And what was the reason for that? There was, it was a one-word reason that, that, I, that I brought up when we were talking about one-to-one -one functions. The reason is that all of the trig functions are periodically, so per, I'm sorry, periodic. So periodically, they repeat their y values. So a function that repeats its y values can't be one-to-one. -one. That's sort of a ver verbal way of saying that the function wouldn't pass the horizontal line test. So let's, um, let's, let's do this, let's create the an inverse sine function, the standard one, and then let's find its derivative. So let's go back to uh, the sine function itself. So let's say let y equal sine of x. And a quick graph of the sine function shows that it's definitely not one to one. So let's take a look at the, the graph of the sine function here. Let's do this. So the sine function, just a real quick graph, looks something like this. Here's the one period of the sine function. <clears throat> okay, let me graph another half a period. So here's one and a half periods of our good old sine function from trig. Okay, definitely not one-to-one. -one. 
So remember how we, we dealt with um, the square root function or the, the squaring function? It wasn't it wasn't one to one, but we we made it we created a one to one function out of it by restricting its domain so that it would pass the horizontal line test. Well, we're gonna do the same thing here. We can't take as as uh, the restricted domain, say zero along the x-axis to pi because it still wouldn't pass the horizontal line test. However, we can take the interval from, let's say, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And if we do that, let me move my pi over 2 over a little bit. If we do that, then we have we definitely have a one-to-one -one function. So I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, in red, I'm going to highlight our restricted function so if we if we take x between pi negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2 then we're looking at a a one to one function so the little red section is one to one let's um let's find the inverse so we're going to let uh, y equal sine of x but we're going to let y equal sine of x for x between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Okay. If we do that, then we'll have y between negative 1 to 1. I guess we would have y between negative 1 to 1 no matter what, because the sign stays between negative 1 and 1. But this is our restricted sine function. So let's find the inverse. It's not real exciting. It's also not real difficult. So how do we find the inverse? We switch x and y's. So one, we switch x's and y's. So if y equals sine of x for x between negative pi over two and pi over two, and also that gives us y is between negative one and one, then we get x equals the sine of y, where y is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, and where x is between negative 1 and 1. Now this, this last little bit with the inequalities is important, because it's going to allow us to take a look at the, the graph of the inverse sine function when, when we're done. Okay, so the, the second step is to solve for y. Okay, this is not difficult. <laughs> Since the function is 1 to 1 now, we can solve for y simply by taking the, the equation x equals sine of y and take the inverse sine of both sides. How can I do that? How can I justify taking the inverse sine of both sides? Well, the function is 1 to 1 now, so the inverse exists. So what I'm going to do is exactly what I said. In red, I think I'll insert, we're going to take the inverse sine of both sides. So inverse sine and sine on the right-hand side cancel out, leaving us with y and equals the inverse sine of x, <clears throat> where x is, x is between negative 1 and 1. So that's our, the domain of the inverse sine function. <clears throat> and y stays between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Let's graph the inverse sine function. Let's take a look at the graph of the function. So the graph of the function should be a reflection of the original function uh, across the line y equals x. So maybe we'll concentrate on approaching it that way. So let's take a look at graphing the inverse function now. So here's a nice set of axes. Uh, let me put in the original sine function here. Let's put the sine function, let's say, as a dotted graph <clears throat> to distinguish it from the inverse sine function, which will be the solid graph. So the original sine function was restricted to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And the sine function lies between negative 1 and 1. 
So what I think I'll do to make things a little easier on us to reflect this graph across the line y equals x, I think I'll identify a few key points and identify on the original function. Then I'll switch the x's and y's on those key points and connect those uh, points together with a graph that's reflected across the line y equals x. Now I said a lot there. If it didn't make sense, just just um, bear with me here. So let's um, let me change colors here. Let's say in blue, I plot the point uh, on the original function, the restricted function, pi over two, comma one, and also negative pi over two comma negative one okay so if I re re, uh, reverse the coordinates on the point pi over two and one I get the point one comma pi over two so let me graph that point so let's put one along the x-axis here pi over two along the y-axis here and the new point is one and then pi over 2. Similarly, I get the point negative 1 and negative pi over 2 on the graph of the inverse. And I'll plot that point. Okay. And maybe I'll move that one point out of the way here. It's kind of in our way. Here, let's move it up a little more. Okay. So let me identify those points in blue that were reflected across the line y equals x, 1 and pi over 2, and also negative 1 and negative pi over 2. Okay. Uh, the origin is also a point on the, the original function. It's also a point then on the inverse. If you switch 0 and 0, you get 0 and 0. So the origin is a third point. And I think that's probably enough for me to connect the dots in the inverse. In fact, I think I'll do it in, uh, I'll draw the inverse in, let's say green. So it shows up a little better here. So I'm going to reflect the graph of the function across the line y equals x to get the green inverse function. Okay, and you can indeed see that it is a reflection across the line y equals x. All right, it might even show up a little better if I draw the, ori the original function not in, in a, as a dotted graph here. Here's the original function. I'm overwriting it in solid. So it appears to be a, a nice reflection <coughs> across the line y equals x. So what you do with that graph, what you ought to do with that graph, you ought to memorize it. It's a good idea to know the graphs of the of some of the inverse trig functions. And I, you notice I said some of the inverse trig functions. Uh, in a trig class, I insist that my students memorize all six of the original functions. But I don't think it's it's necessary for you to memorize all six of the inverse trig functions. In fact, um, we're going to talk much more about this as we go along, but the, there are three most important inverse trig functions. There are the inverse sine, inverse tangent, and inverse secant. The others don't tend to be nearly as important. In fact, they're not important in my opinion. They're not important in STEM, STEM math at all. Um, I'll explain as we go along. Um, it'll be real clear why why the the first three are important and the others are really not uh, in, in not too long. So there's the graph of our inverse sine function. I'd like to get I'd like to get rid of the clutter and just focus on the graph for a second here. So with the help of some video magic, which just means I pause the video. And, and drew the inverse sine function alone. <laughs> With the help of that magic, we have a, we're taking a look now at simply the, the graph of the inverse sine function. So this is this inverse sine function. And notice that it lies between negative one and one. 
and the range, the, the y values are between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. That's the important thing I'd like to focus on now is the range. Um, I'm going to replace y with the inverse sine in that last inequality. The inverse sine lies between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So what that means is that the inverse sine produces angles that are between negative pi over, pi over 2 and pi over 2. The inverse sine gives you angles in standard position in quadrants 4 from negative pi over 2 to 0 or quadrant 1, 0 to pi over 2. That's a very, very important thing going on here. Okay, And that's, that was illustrated earlier with the little mystery that the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, not but, more like and, <laughs> and the inverse sine of 1 half is pi over 6. Now take a look at the graph and interpret this graphically. The inverse sine of 1 half is pi over 6. So if I let x equal 1 half on the sine function, the y value will be pi over 6. Remember, in my earlier example, I also said that the sine of 5 pi over 6 is 1 half. But, now the but is correct here. <laughs> The inverse sine of 1 half doesn't change. It's still 1 pi over 6, not 5 pi over 6. Now here's the problem. Isn't It's not really a problem. Here's the, the solution to this, this seeming problem. Um, if we didn't restrict the graph of the sine function and just reflected it about the line y equals x, we would get the graph that you're seeing now. We would get sort of a, a sine graph that's flipped on its side and that's definitely not a function. If we take a look at x equaling one half again on this sort of uh, exploded inverse sine I don't, for lack of another term, this is the the graph that's on its side twirling up is not the inverse sine function. It wouldn't be. It's not one to one. Um, but if we allowed it, if we didn't make the restriction on the original sign, the inverse sign would look like this. And look what happens when x equals one half. When x equals one half, if we if we go past that first value we get, which is pi over six, we're going to see a second y value up along near pi, which is 5 pi over 6. So the inverse sine would have to be, of 1 half, would have to be pi over 6. And, and uh, that's highlighted with a little arrow there. It would also have to be 5 pi over 6. And a whole lot of other y values that would extend vertically in both directions. So this is the reason why the, even though the sine of 5 pi over 6 is 1 half, the inverse sine of 1 half is just pi over 6. We have to only include that portion of the um, sine function between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, so we get the restricted uh, inverse, so the inverse is an actual function. Okay, now let's get to some calculus. Specifically, let's um, let's... Uh, hunt down the derivative of the inverse sine function. We're looking at now deriving the derivative of the inverse sine function. So let's say let's walk, let's let y equal the inverse sine of x. Now to find the the derivative of the inverse sine function, <coughs> um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to transform this function into a more familiar function, namely the sine function. I'm going to take the sine of both sides and get the sine of y then equals x. Okay, I hope that makes sense. 
If you take the sine of the left-hand side, you get sine of y. If you take the sine of the right-hand side, you get the sine of the inverse sine. Remember, they cancel each other out. So you're left with just x. Now take the derivative of both sides <coughs> implicitly with respect to x. We did this in the last section. I think it was the last section. We were looking at the derivative of uh, the exponential function. I think we did that. Or in, or in, not the last, last section, the section before 6.3. In any case, take the derivative of both sides with respect to x, the derivative of sine is cosine of y, implicit differentiation, or the chain rule says take the derivative of the inside function, so multiply by y prime. The derivative of x is 1, divide both sides by cosine of y, and that's the derivative of the inverse sine. It's not a really good form. I'd like the derivative of, the, of a function of x to also be a function of x and not a function of y. So let's, let's transform this into something a little more familiar. So what I'd like to do is, oh, I'm hoping I can get a shape of a right triangle for myself here. It's not going to be there. So I'm going to draw a little right triangle. I could do this old school, do it myself. So here's a little right triangle. Now, I'm going to go back to the, the uh, original uh, step before I took the derivative. The sine of y equals x. I'm going to write it x over 1. And remember the sine, remember from, from trig, the sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So, if I put as the angle y in the lower left hand corner the sine is opposite x over hypotenuse the pythagorean theorem is going to leave the square root of 1 minus x squared as the remaining side now that might have been a big leap so if in blue i say that main that that missing side is a I get the Pythagorean theorem telling us a squared plus x squared equals 1 squared. So subtract x squared from both sides. Square root both sides. And there's the justification. So that missing side needs to be the square root of 1 minus x squared. And let's finish this off. The cosine. Remember, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, the adjacent is the square root of 1 minus x squared, and the hypotenuse is 1. So adjacent over hypotenuse is just 1 over, I'm oh, sorry, is just square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, let's put all this together. There's a, there's a bottom line formula here, and I think I'll take a chance and use a nice thick marker for this. Derivative with respect to x over the inverse sine of x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Look at how strange that result is. The derivative of the inverse sine of x isn't even a trig function. It doesn't even involve any trig functions at all. Okay, Some pretty strange stuff going on there. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look at a specific example using this using this important idea. So, for example, let's say find y prime a. Let's say y equals the inverse sine of x cubed. Okay. So we'll use a combination of a little calc 1 and calc 2 here. Calc 1 says that if I have the composition of two functions, and I do, we have the inside function and the inverse sine of x, the outside function is cubing. You take the derivative of the outside function, leave the inside function alone, then multiply by the derivative of the inside. Well, the, the inside is just the the inverse sine function that we spent all this time finding the derivative of. So we put all this together and we get 3 times the inverse sine of x squared over 
with the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, and there's nothing we can do with that exponent of the new, in the numerator. Okay, I want you to recall. Recall. I talked about this, I think, in either the first or second videos that I did for you guys. That the inverse sine of x, this is the inverse sine of x, is very different from sine of x to the negative 1 power. Sine of x to the negative 1 power, that's cosecant of x, or 1 over sine of x. Negative one exponents, negative one superscript, are, uh, means different things. If written this way, it means inverse, and it's not an exponent. If written in the second way, it's an exponent. Very different uses, usages of the same symbol. Same symbol to represent very, very different things. Okay, so be careful about that. Be careful that you have, you have to differentiate, no pun intended, between whether you're looking at an exponent or you're looking at a um, uh, inverse notation. Okay, let's take a look at another example here. B. How about uh, y equals the inverse sine of x cubed? Now these two functions are different. A and B are very different functions. In A, the very first thing you do after you put an x in is you take the inverse sine of that, and then the last thing you do is cube. In B, the first thing you do is cube x, and then you take the inverse sine of the result. So these are these are both composition functions, but they're they're composed in different orders. Okay, so the, the chain rule says you, you take the derivative of the outside function. That means the last function that's that's done after inputting x. The outside function is inverse sine. The derivative of the inverse sine is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared, if it was just x. So we take the derivative of, of the first function, uh, of the outside function, but we leave the inside function, x cubed, alone. And then we multiply that by the derivative of the inside function. So we get y prime equals 3x squared over the square root of 1 minus x to the sixth power. Okay, let's take a look at another one. C. Suppose I want the derivative of y equals this function. This is mostly just to check to make sure you were paying attention with when I um, recalled a couple of things earlier. When I recalled a couple of things earlier, I, I wanted to, to differentiate in your mind between the inverse as a uh, in the the superscript as an inverse notation versus superscript as an exponent. So here, the superscript, the negative one, is in fact an exponent. So this is a fancy way of saying cosecant. One over sine is cosecant. And in Calc 1, we learn the derivative of cosecant. The derivative of all the cofunctions are minus, and the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. You might have forgotten that, or it might, might be a little fuzzy for you right now. So there you go as a reminder. Okay. Okay. Now I mentioned that there are three most important inverse trig functions in calculus. The inverse sine, the inverse tangent, and the inverse secant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to construct the inverse cosine function because I think you ought to see see the inverse cosine function derived or constructed. Then I'll just state the the derivative. It, it in, in fact the derivative is very simple once you have the inverse sine done. The inverse cosine has a very simple derivative once you have the inverse sine. So now let's go on to the inverse cosine function. Let's say let y equal cosine of x. We have the same problem that we did with the um, sine function that it's not one to one. So ooh, that's a terrible beginning to my cosine function. 
here's the cosine function here's a little bit before the the y-axis let me continue the cosine function on if I continue the cosine function I get this if I continue it on even further I get this I'm gonna cheat and pull the screen over so here's uh, one period and one quarter of a period for the cosine function. The cosine function, like all the trig functions, is not one-to-one. -one. So we need to restrict its domain. The unfortunate thing here is that we can't restrict the, do the same, we can't choose the same restricted domain as we did for the inverse sine. If we choose between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, the cosine is not one-to-one. -one. So what we do with the cosine function, I'll highlight this in red, we're going to restrict the domain to be just this highlighted red part. We're going to restrict the domain of the cosine to be between 0 and pi. If I do that, you notice that the, the, the graph that remains is one to one. Let me show you what happens if we, I'm going to make the, the part, that, oops, I'm keeping that part. I'm going to dot the parts that I'm not going to take away. So let me do this, dot, dot, I'm dotting, dotting, dotting. I'm just throwing my electronic eraser through here. So if I remove all the, the dotted part, that remaining part is pretty clearly one-to-one. -one. So I'm going to let y equal cosine of x for x between neg oops, not negative one to one. <laughs> for x between zero and pi. Okay, then we get, of course, y is between negative one and one. Let's find the inverse. One. Switch x and y. So let's if we start with y equals cosine of x and we switch x and y, we get x equals cosine of y. Um, of course, switching x and y mean, mean that means that we also switch x and y in in uh, the inequalities that are satisfied. So y lies between zero and pi. That's the important one and x lies between negative 1 and 1. So let's uh, solve for y. If we take the cosine of both, I'm oh, sorry, inverse cosine of both sides, if we take the inverse cosine of both sides, we end up with inverse cosine of x equals y for x between negative 1 and 1, and y between 0 and 1. Okay, I'm not sure if you can hear that. It's my dog snoring. Sorry about that. It's Thomas, <laughs> my border collie. <clears throat> okay, I guess my lecture put him to sleep. That's all right. My lectures put me to sleep too. <laughs> no, they don't. I do drink a lot of coffee though. So okay, whatever. <laughs> TMI. Too much information. So let's um let's take a look at what the graph of the the inverse cosine would look like. Then. Okay. Maybe I'll do a little video magic. So on the on the restricted cosine function, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the same thing as I did with the when I constructed a graph of the inverse sine. I'm gonna identify three points. I'll identify the point zero one on the original function. The point pi over two zero and the point pi negative 1 on the original function. Let's switch x's and y's and get the corresponding points on the inverse. Okay, so switching x's and y's, like a little more y-axis. <clears throat> if I switch the, the coordinates on 0, 1, I get 1, 0. If I switch the, the coordinates on pi over 2, 0, I get 0, pi over 2. So I got that 1, 0, 0, pi over 2, and finally pi negative 1, switch coordinates, I get negative 1 and pi. 
and that point is right about here. So here's negative one pot. Okay. So I have these three points. I'm going to connect them in a nice smooth graph. Try it again. I don't know why I'm doing this in blue, but that's all right. That did turn out real nice. Let's see here. Okay, that'll do. That'll work. Not in the mood for any stop camera video action action here so okay so there's the graph of the inverse cosine function the inverse cosine graph lies between zero and pi along the y-axis this is important for us this is saying this is telling us that the inverse cosine function returns angles very differently than the inverse sine very different quadrants the inverse cosine lies between 0 and pi. Remember that the inverse sine was between or is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Very, very different ideas going on here. I mean, I'll illustrate that with a specific example. So the uh, cosine of pi over 6 equals uh, radical 3 over 2. So the inverse sine of radical 3 over, of oh, not inverse sine, the inverse cosine, inverse cosine of radical 3 over 2 is pi over 6. Okay. Now, the cosine of 5 pi over 6 is negative radical 3 over 2. And the inverse cosine, I keep on the right side, the inverse cosine of negative radical 3 over 2 is 5 pi over 6. That's correct. Okay, and and we, can see, we can see that from the graph. Um, the inverse cosine of radical 3 over 2 is pi over 6. So pi over 2 along the y-axis is there, so pi over 6 is about right there. So the inverse sine of radical 3, I think radical 3 over 2 is about 0.9, I think. Uh, the inverse, uh, or rather, if, if I draw 5 pi over 6 on the y-axis that corresponds to an x value of oh, not turning out real nice negative radical 3 over 2 okay I guess it could take a second to, to draw that better but yeah, I guess it's okay Okay, so that's okay. We just have to realize that we get very different restrictions for the uh, inverse sine and inverse cosine. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to put it in a darker color there, just to, for emphasis. Okay. <clears throat> now, I mentioned that I'm not going to go through the details for the derivative of the inverse cosine. They're very similar to the inverse sine. The derivative with respect to x of the inverse sine it is, we figured that out earlier, it's 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Definitely ought to memorize that. The derivative with respect to x of the inverse cosine through similar arguments, algebraic arguments, algebraic and geom geometric arguments, is just the opposite of that. And this is one of the reasons why the most important trig functions are inverse sine, inverse tangent, and inverse secant. Because the, in, the derivatives of the inverse other ones are just the opposites of those. So we really don't need to concern ourselves too much with, with, those, um, <clears throat> with those functions. Okay, so just, just for emphasis here, I'll highlight 
those derivatives in red. Okay, let's let's uh, let's move on to let's move on to to the inverse tangent after we look at a at a couple of identities that might that you might you know, might be important for you that are important for you. Well, let me ask you. I think we talked about this, but what's the sign of the inverse sine of x? This should be pretty quick for you. Function and inverses cancel each other out, so x. Similarly, cosine and inverse cosine of x, also x. And if we compose compose the functions in the reverse order, we get the same thing. The inverse sine of the sine of x is x, etc. Okay. Now on to the inverse tangent. Let's let y equal tangent of x. Tangent is not one to one. So what I'll do is I'll graph a little bit of the tangent function. Now as I'm graphing the tangent function, I want to remind you that all of the trig functions are periodic. And all but two of the trig functions, all but two of them have a period of 2 pi. In fact, the tangent and cotangent, see if you can anticipate my question, the tangent and cotangent have a period of how much? 1 pi. The tangent lies between negative, uh, oh, the first period, one period of the tangent function lies between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. The tangent function has asymptotes. In fact, the only functions that don't have asymptotes, the only trig functions are sine and cosine. They're nicely behaved. The rest of the trig functions have asymptotes. And right now we're talking about the period of the tangent. The period is pi, is 1 pi. This is, you're looking at one period right now between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So if I were to draw a second period, I would just have a copy of this graph. We can do a little better. Okay. Maybe not. We'll see. I'll just have a copy of this. It's between pi over 2. See if you can guess what the, the 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 second asymptote to the right of the y-axis would be. At what x value is that second asymptote? The first one is at pi over two. Then we have a zero at pi. Then what? Where's this point? What's the last point here? Three pi over two. Okay, so this is two periods. Two periods. Okay. Easy to construct. A restriction to get it one to one. Just look at the first period. If we, I'm going to highlight the first period in, in, in red. I'm going to try to see if I can get, use a nice thick red marker here. Like I went a little overboard with the marker, but the, if we look at the restriction of um, on the x-axis uh, between negative pi over two pi over 2, not including the endpoints, because the endpoints are, are give us uh, asymptotes, then it looks like we have a one-to-one -one function. So let's let y equal tan tangent of x for x between negative pi over 2, not including pi over 2, and positive pi over 2, not including positive pi over 2. If I do that, then y will between, be between negative infinity and positive infinity. The, 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 the tangent function extends infinitely in both directions, up and down. So the range is all real numbers. Okay, so let's, um, let's take a look at the inverse. One, switch x and y. Well, in order to switch x and y, we have to have uh, y equals tangent. For x between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, the sneezing border collie, <laughs> and y between negative infinity and positive infinity. So, oops, not step 2 yet. Switch x and y. So that gives us x equals tangent of y, where y is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And uh, x is between negative infinity. X is between negative infinity and positive infinity. 
Okay. So switch X and Y. Solve for Y. Usual business. Take the inverse tangent of both sides. So I get the inverse tangent of X equals Y. X is between negative infinity and positive infinity. And Y is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Let's construct the graph of the inverse. So, um, notice that we're taking, again, the restriction of the tangent function between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So, the, the asymptotes for the original function are x equals negative pi over 2 and x equals positive pi over 2. So, the corresponding asymptotes for the inverse, we switch x's and y's asymptotes. If you miss that, the, for the original tangent, we have asymptotes. Asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes. x equals negative pi over 2 and x equals positive pi over 2. Those are the equations of vertical lines. So now the corresponding asymptotes on the inverse become horizontal asymptotes. Negative pi over 2 and y equals positive pi over 2. Okay. So let's graph these horizontal asymptotes. Here's y equals pi over 2. Here's y equals negative pi over 2. The original function goes through the origin. So the uh, inverse also goes through the origin. If we switch x's and y's again on the inverse, uh, on the origin, we still get the origin. So now think about this. As x approaches pi over 2 from the left on the, in, on the original function, y goes to infinity. So again, on the original function, x approaches pi over 2 from the left, y approaches infinity. So on the inverse, reverse x's and y's. As x approaches infinity, y creeps into pi over 2 from below. Okay. And similarly, as x goes to negative infinity, y should approach negative pi over 2. So that's the graph of, of the inverse tangent function, the inverse tangent function. Okay, good idea to memorize that one. Okay. Our course, you have access, you have access to these online and, and so forth, but you ought to memorize these, okay? So let's take a look at the, the derivative of the inverse tangent. Then we'll, we'll very quickly look at the derivative of the inverse cotangent. And then, and then uh, look at the, more, the most difficult of the, of the inverse trig functions is inverse secant. So the derivative of the inverse tangent. Let's do this. If y equals inverse tangent of x, then the tangent of y, if I take tangent of both sides, equals x. Now I'm going to take the derivative of both sides implicitly with respect to x. The derivative of tangent is, see if you can remember, I already put the first letter there. Derivative tangent, secant, is it secant tangent or is it secant squared? If you thought secant squared, you're correct. If you didn't, you're not correct. <laughs> the derivative of tangent is secant squared y times the derivative of the inside y prime. Derivative of x is 1. y prime equals 1 over secant squared y. Can you think of a simpler expression for secant squared? 1 over secant squared? Well, what's 1 over secant? It's cosine. So 1 over secant squared is cosine squared. Okay. Now I'm going to turn this into a function of x. Okay. 
So I'm going to do the same thing I did with the inverse sine. I'm going to draw a little right triangle. I'm going to put the Y in the as the angle in the lower left hand corner, and there's our original definition: tangent Y equals X over one. And see if you can remember from trig. Tangent is what? Adjacent, opposite, hypotenuse. What is it? It's opposite over adjacent. And in our case, we're using x for opposite, 1 for adjacent. Pythagorean theorems gives us the square root of 1 plus x squared. And the cosine squared is our derivative. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? Cosine is adjacent, 1 over hypotenuse squared to 1 plus x squared. What's wrong with it? Well, it's cosine squared. So that was that's what was missing. If we square the radical, the radical disappears. And we're looking at the derivative with respect to x of the inverse tangent of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Okay. Reminder, the derivative with respect to x of the inverse cotangent then is minus 1 over 1 plus x squared. We've looked at the derivative with respect to x of the inverse sine. This is just sort of a recap. 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. We then accepted from me with faith <laughs> that the derivative of the inverse cotangent is negative of the derivative of the inverse sine. There's one more important one left. Remember the most important of the three inverse trig functions for the this, for this, uh, stem major math are the inverse sine, the inverse tangent, and the inverse secant. So let's dig into the derivative of the inverse secant function. The inverse secant and the inverse cosecant functions are the are the most complicated of the trig functions. They have asymptotes like the like the tangent function, the inverse tangent does, but they're not continuous. And it, it, one period, each period is not continuous, so it is a bit of a problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct the graph of the secant and then we'll restrict its domain and then we'll look at at finding the the derivative of the inverse secant so with our usual video magic i i drew a, a set of axes and i drew some asymptotes where where the that are the asymptotes for or some of the asymptotes for the uh secant function so we're looking at the not the inverse yet, just the just the regular plain old secant function. So the secant function goes through the point 0, 1. Just basically a really quick reminder of the graph of the secant. It's not a pleasant graph. Um, one period of the secant function consists of sort of one cup that opens upward and one cup that opens downward. From pi negative one. This is one period of the secant function equals secant x. And the period of the secant function is pi over two, and that's the distance between negative pi over two on the left and three pi over two on the right. The restriction for the inverse secant is kind of strange. Clearly, the, the inverse secant's not one to one. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose x between zero and pi over two, but we're not going to let x actually equal pi over two because we have an asymptote there. We're also going to choose x between pi and three pi over two. So in, in red, here's our restriction. Very strange. After all these years, 
it's still a strange restriction, but we we need to do something to make this one to one. And this is this is one of two standards. Uh, textbooks don't all keep the same restriction. I'm dotting the part that we're eliminating. Textbooks don't always use the same restriction. Some textbooks will take the restriction x between zero and pi and just and just remove pi over two. So you, the the graph that remains, the graph that remains there, and I'll highlight it with a marker here. If that graph that's happening there, the graph that remains is our restricted secant graph. That's not even our inverse yet. That's just the secant. Okay, so let's take a look at graphing the inverse secant. Okay. Well, I guess we should put in some more details here. The, the, so we're going to let we're going to let y equal secant of x for x between zero and pi over two. I'm going to write this in interval notation for x between zero and pi over two, and then skip over pi over 2 to pi, and then take uh, x between pi over 2, I'm sorry, pi, and 3 pi over 2. Okay, and the range, the range will be uh, y in absolute value is greater than or equal to 1. That's a fancy way of saying y is greater than 1 or equal to 1 or y is less than or equal to negative 1. And you can see that in green. Either y is greater than 1 or less than greater than or equal to 1 or less than or equal to negative 1. So the green is the range pictured there. Okay, so let's get at this inverse. Strange, strange inverse. So, one, switch x and y. So, if one, we have switching x and y, we get x equals sine, oops, oops, if not two, <laughs> x equals secant of y. Okay, where the domain we get from the range of the original function. So the domain is x between negative one. Uh, no, x is greater than or equal to one. The absolute value of x is greater than or equal to one. And the range is a strange range. The range was that zero to pi over two. Skip over pi to three pi over two. Let's get the graph of this ugly beast here. Okay. So notice that on the original function, x equals pi over two is the, um, x equals pi over two is a vertical asymptote. So on the inverse, y equals pi over two has to be a horizontal asymptote. I'm noticing I didn't do step two. <laughs> That's a quickie. So for step two, um, let's do this. Uh, y equals inverse secant of x with uh, domain and range <laughs> as stated. Sorry, I got a little sloppy there. Okay, so uh, back to the graph is x equals pi over two is a vertical asymptote on the function. So y equals pi over two is a horizontal asymptote on, on the inverse. The original function goes through the point zero, one. So the inverse goes through one, zero. The original function approaches positive infinity as x approaches the asymptote. So the inverse approaches pi over 2, the asymptote, as x approaches infinity. 
Okay, the function goes through the point pi negative 1. So the inverse goes through negative 1 pi. So there's negative 1 pi. The original function has x equals pi over 2 as a vertical asymptote. x equals pi over 2 is a vertical asymptote. So y equals pi over 2 is a horizontal asymptote. So I'm going to need more y-axis there. Here's y equals pi, uh, 3 pi over 2. Why does it pi over 2? 3 pi over 2. So, <clears throat> as now check check out the original uh, function secant near pi three pi over two. As x approaches three pi over two from the left, y approaches negative infinity. So x approaches negative infinity. Oops, y approaches three pi over two, and that is a strange looking graph. That is the inverse secant function. Now I went very quickly through the, inver the graph of the inverse secant, uh, mostly because the its actual graph is not so important for us. Um, in fact, uh, I can't imagine where you need it very much in, in, in the actual graph. But that is the graph of the inverse secant. What is important for us, this is a calculus class here, so what is important for us is the derivative of the inverse secant. It's one of the three most important ones, inverse sine, inverse tangent, inverse secant are most important. So let's identify its derivative. So if I let y equal secant x, inverse secant x, I can use a standard now for us. I take the secant of both sides. I'm looking for the derivative. The derivative of both sides. The derivative of secant is secant squared? Nope. The derivative of secant is secant tangent times the derivative of the inside. Derivative of x is 1. Divide both sides by secant tangent. So you're looking at 1 over uh, secant y tangent y. Okay, standard stuff. This is becoming standard stuff for us. I'm going to construct a, a small right triangle with the angle y. Substitution, uh, not the substitution, but the definition is secant y equals x. I don't do real well with secants. So I do better with cosine. So this says cosine equals 1 over x. Remember, secant is 1 over cosine. So recall. Recall that secant uh, of theta equals 1 over cosine of theta. Okay, so um, the cosine of theta is adjacent 1 over hypotenuse x. So what's left for the opposite side? Square root of square root of well one squared the, the the horizontal side plus the square root squared has to be x squared so a little pythagorean theorem if you, if you want to go ahead and put the details in for yourself that's fine but the pythagorean theorem would leave us with the square root of x squared minus one let's finish this up one over secant of y well secant secant of y is x and so remember we started with that secant of y is x but tangent of y from the triangle is opposite over hypotenuse oops i don't want to go in red is opposite over hypotenuse and that's the square root of x squared minus one over one which is square root of x squared minus one final result is the derivative with respect to x of the inverse secant of x is one over x times the square root of x squared minus 1. Okay. Lastly, no details. We don't need to look at any details. The derivative of the inverse cosine, secant, inverse cosecant, is just the opposite of that.
Okay. Okay. For a complete review, for a complete summary, the derivative of the inverse sine. I know I've stated it a couple times. I just want you to see them. 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. The derivative of not the inverse cosine. I'm not interested. The inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. So you see all on the same screen the three most important inverse trig function derivatives. Inverse sine, inverse secant, and inverse tangent. Okay. Okay. Let's um come to, to a close here. We still have a few examples I want to look at. We got all the, the theoretical stuff out of the way. Let's take a look at some examples. Suppose um suppose I'm interested in uh, we did some derivatives earlier. Let's take a look at some integrals. So let's see if you can get these. What is I'm not even going to label them as an example yet. What are these three antiderivatives equal to? I think you're going to get them right away. These are the corresponding integral forms for those three formulas that I highlighted in red. So what's the most general antiderivative of 1 over 1 minus x squared? It's inverse sine. Well, why? Because the derivative of the inverse sine is 1 over <laughs> the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, so what would be the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared? Most general antiderivative is inverse tangent of x plus a constant. And the inverse secant is the most general antiderivative of 1 over x times the square root of 1, uh, x squared minus 1. Notice the, the order of 1 minus x squared and x squared minus 1 in the first and third integrals. Keep those straight. It's common for students to reverse those. Okay, so a couple of quick quick examples will we'll finish things up. Example. Evaluate. Evaluate some integrals. Let's see here. Well, in fact, I think we'll evaluate only one here. This is a good. Suppose I want the most general antiderivative of x times uh, 1 over x times the square root of x squared minus 4. In fact, also, I'm going to relabel this example. It's sort of a, a freebie as a sort of a hint for your exam coming up. I'm going to label this example A. I, I'm thinking about using this example as an example I want you to refer to uh, on exam two. Okay, so let's do it. Let's, let's, let's evaluate this example, or this integral, for example, A. Well, you know, look at the form. Look at the form of this integral. It looks very much like the third form, just above. It looks very, very similar to this third form. Very similar, though, is not the same. <laughs> so the idea here, I'm going to use a technique to, to try to force this integral to be in that, that standard form. Okay? And I may ask you to do that for a particular example on the, on the exam coming up. Okay, so... Um, I'd like a, f a 1 to be in the place where that 4 is. So I can use some algebra on that to make that happen. I can use some algebra. Underneath the radical sign, I could factor out that 4. Okay. If I factor it out of x squared, well, there's no 4 as a factor of x squared, so I'm going to have to write x squared over 4. And I factored it out of the 4. So there's our first step. Now, that radical 4, I'm going to use a property from algebra. Uh, 
Yes, I want you to recall from algebra, the square root of AB is the square root of A times the square root of B. As long as, or in particular, if A and B are both positive. So if, if A, A and B are both positive, then the square root of AB is the square root of A times the square root of B. I'm going to use that here. I'm going to use that to take that square root of 4 and separate it to, into another radical and then bring it out of the integral sign. Because constants can be factored out of the integral sign. I have 1 over x left times the square root of, well, x squared over 4 is the same thing as x over 2 squared. So under the radical sign, I have x over 2 squared minus 1. And that's not quite the third form. But we have, from Calc 1, u substitution that we'll get that x over 2 out of there and we'll put it in as its own variable. And so u equals x over 2 du equals 1 half dx and dx equals 2 du and we proceed with our integral. Let's move over here. So this integral now is the square root of 4 is 2 and let's make the substitution. We have 1 on top. We have x in the denominator. Well, if u equals x over 2, that means x equals 2u. Okay, so x equals 2u back, under the, back in the integral. x over 2 is u. Uh, dx is not quite du. dx is 2du. And this is working out real nice. In fact, it's working out super here. So the 2 from the 2 du and the 2 in the denominator of the integral sign and the integral sign cancel out. And I'm looking at 1 half 1 over u times the square root of u squared minus 1 du. That's exactly the third form. This is exactly the third form. So this is equal to one half what? One half what? Inverse secant. Inverse secant of what? Well, u. But u, and this finishes out a problem, u equals uh, x over 2. And we have our solution. Okay, so this was example A. Now let's take a look at our very last example, our very last example. An example. I'm going to prove a trig identity, but I want to use some calculus to do it. I want to prove, and this is an interesting fact, when you take the inverse sine of x plus the inverse cosine of x, where x is, is, is uh, in both the domain of both of these inverse trig functions, you always get, no matter what, you always get pi over 2. That's interesting. At least that's interesting for me. If it's not interesting for you, that's all right. But I, but I want to prove this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to get tricky here. So here's my proof. Not too tricky. It's tricky because I'm using calculus to do that. I'm going to identify a function. So I'm going to let f of x equal the function inverse sine of x plus inverse cosine of x. And I'm going to find its derivative. The derivative of the inverse sine, 1 over... What's the order? Is it x squared minus 1 or 1 minus x squared? It's 1 minus x squared. It's x squared minus 1 for the inverse secant. Plus the derivative of the inverse cosine. Well, the inverse cosine is just the opposite of that. So f prime of x, here's where the trick starts. f prime of x is 0. Well, if f prime of x is 0, if the derivative is 0, what does the function have to be? 
the only function that gives you a zero derivative is a constant. So that says that inverse sine of x plus inverse cosine of x is a constant. The only thing I have to do is get that constant to equal pi over 2. Well, I'm going to show you how they get the, how I get that to happen. I'm going to let x equal 0 in the original function. Not the derivative, but the original function. The inverse sine of 0 plus the inverse cosine of 0. The inverse sine of 0 is 0. Inverse cosine of uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> inverse sine of 0 is 0, but the inverse cosine of 0 is pi over 2, because the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So f of 0 is pi over 2. Not f of x, not the whole f of x, but just f of 0. f of 0 is pi over 2. How can I go from there to f of x must be constant for any x? Answer? Because the function has to be equal to constant. We just showed that the function has to be constant, not just for 0, but for every x. I showed that at x equals 0, I get pi over 2. Since the function is constant, the function must also equal pi over 2 for all x. This does it. The function was inverse sine plus inverse cosine. And that must equal pi over 2. Done with proof. Not only are we done with the proof, we're done with the section. So this ends section 6.6 .6 in our textbook. And feel free to dig into homework whenever you can get it started on it. And I'm looking forward to talking with you all again soon.